Something's going to happen. Something wonderful. G'day fans and welcome to another exciting episode of Talk Nerdy to Me. Now you may have already noticed we're missing Jeffra. Now apparently he's on the line trying to dial in. So uh, we're going to try and see if we can get him connected and uh, having to join the family. So don't worry about that. So importantly though, uh, welcome to this fantastic 13th episode of our show. And 13 for MPS and I is actually a bit of a big deal. And we also have to welcome our Facebook and YouTube viewers. And I'll explain a bit more about what YouTube later on. MPS, how are you doing tonight? Yeah, I'm all right. It's a bit chilly out there in, in old Melbourne town, but not as cold as it has been. But uh, we're all nice and snuggly, buggly, all warm and toasty in here now. So Very good. Um, here's a, a bit of a discussion I wanted to have. Um, it's funny enough because all three of us at some point in our lives and uh, we're involved in costuming and, uh, and all that. I mean, I'm not a fan of the term cosplay but that's what everybody calls it these days. And for those who don't know, the literal definition of cosplay is from the anim uh, animated anime world where you replicate an actual character you're actually playing a character that's where it came from so that's what cosplaying so costuming is when you make things cosplay is when you play the character that's the actual definition but they've sort of brought in that now now if you put on a bucket on your head you're cosplaying so i thought i'd just mention that but the term cosplay has been around for a lot longer than the anime it's been around since the 1920s it, yeah yeah hey. It's it's entered. Hang on, the term may have that may be true, but it's entered the mainstream like community. I mean, I mean, when we were doing costuming back when now the word cosplay never existed. Uh, yeah, I, know. I, I did some checking on to say what's the difference between costuming and cosplaying, and I actually looked yeah. it up, and it was actually like uh, adapted by the anime fan base because when you're playing an actual character anyway look it doesn't really matter um the point being that uh, you know, i prefer to call it costuming but you know each their own um and i was just going to ask a uh, a bit of a question as to whether it's getting a little too serious these days um once upon a time you could walk around a th uh, an event with a bucket on your head and have a bit of fun and a few laughs and uh, you know it would be great but these days there seems to be a massive focus on all screen accurate and getting these details right and huge amounts of money are being poured into it. Now, I'm going to use an example here. Uh, I think Daniel's on the line uh, if he's watching this. He has a friend in um, uh, Queensland who uh, made a replica of the Captain Phasma costume from um, the wow. more recent Star Wars movies. And, of course, Phasma's costume is chrome. Right, and now when I asked this lady whose name I've just gone blank, forgotten, I asked her how much did it cost to get the chrome work done. She didn't tell me, but the way she reacted gave me the impression it was thousands of dollars, like thousands of dollars, not thousand, thousands of dollars. Mm. That's the impression I got. It wasn't a case of a few hundred, it was thousands. And she was actually almost embarrassed to say what it was. And I thought, you know, I get the whole thing of hobbies and its interests and that. Renee, thank you, Daniel. Uh, and you sort of think, of, Okay, so how far do you go before you're going too far? Um, I mean, it's their own and it's all great and wonderful. But what do you guys think? I mean, do you think it's actually getting a little bit too serious these days with the way people are um, doing their costumes and stuff? Well, I mean, I can tell you that back in the 70s and 80s, no one was doing Cylon costumes because, I mean, all that chrome cost a fortune. But obviously, you know, uh, in the the zeros and the 2010s and all that, it's not beyond people wanting to spend that money. So that's a big difference. I've got something else to say, MPS. Is there anything you want to add in? Yeah, I will, but you say what you want to say first. All right. So it's important to remember, and this is actually really, really critical, okay, what the because I've had people discuss this with me on uh, multiple occasions. It's like, why is the costuming thing so big? And the reason why it's so big is because of the, at the pop culture expos both here and overseas. Now, in our day, my day, you know, Jeff Rose, my day, if you wore a costume to an event, you may be, if you're lucky, seen by 100 people, 200 people max, right? Have a couple of photographs, it's all shits and giggles. No worries. These days, you can be seen by 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 people. And, of course, the way to get noticed is to wear outfits that are just absolutely stunning. How do you stand out from the crowd, okay? And, you know, you get all these pictures everywhere and they're put on social media. There's an incentive to really go to town on your outfit because it's like, well, hey, if I'm going to get dressed as Batman, but the guy next to me looks like an absolute block, he stepped off the screen, he's going to get the photos, I'm not. 
And of course, it's a, it's a bit of an ego thing. I think I think a lot of people who wear costumes they mm -hmm. want to be say, "Look at me, look at me." And for that reason, the quality thing is just amped right up to the point where it's almost you're like, oh, "I can't wear this at this this gig because I wore it at the last gig. I've got to wear something new or something different." And it's because of the expos, both here and overseas, your San Diego Comic Cons, that the costuming thing has become so big. Because I can tell you, prior to two thousand and seven, when Armageddon first started in Victoria. It was hardly anything in terms of costuming, right? Armageddon comes in, 20,000 people turn up. Suddenly people realise, oh, shit, I've really got to get my good outfit on because, hey, I want to be the star of the show effectively. And it's just like snowballed from there. So um, that's the reason why I think it's occurred the way it has. MPS, what do you want to say, man? I was going to say, I think it's a combination of a few things here. I think it depends on your level of commitment to whatever the costume is that you want to wear. Uh, because for me, the bat suit... For my my bat suit is completely different to everyone else's. It's custom made. It's not bought off the rack. It's not the Dark Knight outfit. It's not the Michael Keaton. It's not the Adam West. It is off. It is completely custom. Um, uh, so when someone sees me in a group, it's completely different, you know. And yet I I don't get picked out, even though I'm the right height and the right build sort of thing for it. I still don't get picked out, and it's for some reason those who want to jump in front of other people to take the photos get that sort of attention more than I do. I sort of sit, sit in the background more like the character and, and just if someone wants a photo, that's all well and good. Um, but it's also, I think, those costumes that are, you don't know what they are, you know, and the manga and anime ones are in that list totally. You know, the bright colours, the big things that come off them and all that sort of stuff, you've got no idea who they are but they just look spectacular. And it could be the costumes taken them a year to build and it's the only outing it'll see. Um, but, but keep in mind, though, just because you don't know who they are doesn't mean that their fan followers don't know who they are. I, I know, I know. And that's the same as when you wear your V costume. You know, mm. a lot of people don't know who you are, but you're one of the only ones wearing a V costume. Mm. Uh, so it all depends on... Well, it's our franchise. We know who we are. We know who we're talking about, and that's why we wear the costumes. For me to wear um, a Doctor Who costume would be off, would be wrong, you know, because I'm not the biggest Doctor Who fan, but for me to wear a bat suit makes perfect sense, you know. So I think in that sort of sense, you, you go with what you know. Um, and, you know, I know plenty of people have worn costumes who they barely know their character, but they fit the image of the character. Mm. Um, I agree with what Colin said here, uh, and I have seen videos on YouTube, especially in America, where um, people have gone along and just photographed or videoed people in their costumes and made videos of the video, if that makes sense at all. So it's just like montages of, of, of people. And, of course, they're standing out from the crowd now. And I agree with Michelle now that there's, um, there's money to be won. Uh, it's become a lot more serious. And... You do look at some of the workmanship that goes into some of these things, and it's, it is very spectacular. Of course, 3D printing now is just amping things up all over again as well. But I was always curious to say, um, does that mean that there's no room anymore for someone who just wants to wear a bucket on their head and just walk into an event and go, you know what, I may not get photographed by anybody, but, hey, I'm still having a bit of fun? Or is it a case yeah. of, oh, no, no, I, I can't do that. I have to be as perfect as possible because I'll embarrass myself. And, um, yeah, I'm not sure how that works. Jeff, are you going to say something? Yeah, I, I've seen a lot of costumes that have come out where they've done uh, mismashes of different things or they've been uh, using a stock standard uh, uh, costume like a, a stormtrooper, but they've added on something that makes it a bit different. So uh, I think at one stage someone did actually do a stormtrooper with a bucket on its head and then sort of next thing you know you're seeing a stormtrooper with uh, kermit the frog on or so there's these blends of different costumes that people realize well i can't take it to the next level i can only take it so far so let's do this sort of uh mismatch and sort of uh, and get people's attention and one of the, and there's sometimes best way to get attention is maybe just to do something that's so clever and one example of that one was some um, a very simple, clever idea that got everyone's um, attention was that uh, a couple dressed up as uh, um, uh, Bruce Wayne's parents and they would just stand next to uh, Batman 
And uh, it's like people got the gag. So because uh, they'd be saying, oh, we're proud of your son. And it was a very simple costume, but it uh, was so clever that everyone just loved it. And it, it got so much social media response. So you don't have to be necessarily uh, putting in the dollars as long as you can maybe uh, as it, just do something different and creative and, as you said, individual. Yeah, it's funny. Um, you are right. You don't need to do it, but a lot of people are doing it. And it's become an industry now. There was a time if you wanted costumes made, you had to know somebody personally who could do them, a seamstress or someone who could do like armour work or whatever else. And then, of course, suddenly overseas organisations, especially in Asia, suddenly twigged on the fact that, hey, if they can do replicas of all these outfits, they'll, they'll have a fantastic market and people will just buy these things. And I've seen there's sites you can go to to get replicas of... Um, uh, Federation uniforms from Star Trek, the Wrath of Khan, are like two and a half grand is the starting price, you know, it's just freaking insane. And you do wonder, it's like, well, how much is like too much? And I know of one lady, I don't know her name, Daniel will know who I'm talking about. Um, he has all these costumes relating to the um, Disney princesses, you know, Snow White and Sleeping Beauty and whatever else. And to her credit, when she's dressed up, she looks absolutely fantastic with the hair, the makeup, the whole bit. And I remember one time I actually asked her, and because I, I was very curious, then I said, and actually asked her face to face, and I said, Do you actually make these things yourself? And she actually said, bluntly, without even blinking her eyes, she said, No, my fairy godmother credit card pays for these. So, in other words, she just orders them from Thailand, they send over, and she's a pace written, she's off and running. But of course, it wasn't a case of just one outfit, it was like four, five, six, seven, eight. And, um, and I think that's the trap that a lot of people are getting into now that they're feeling as though, oh, they have to do something new because they can't be seen to be wearing the same thing over and over again, which to other people, we wouldn't necessarily care, or you'd get your your mileage out of something before you move it on to something else. And uh, I do wonder about that. It's like, um, is it getting too all-consuming? Um, oh, Emily, okay, yeah, thank you. I never knew a name. Thanks, Daniel. I knew you'd know who I was talking about. Um, but, yes, yeah, it sort of makes you wonder. So do you pick a, a field that you're a specialist in and just focus on that? Um, yeah, not sure. What do you guys think? Well, I, I find it interesting that sort of people spend all that kind of money. You think, what happens with the uh, the costume? Do they keep it forever or do they sort of um, uh, put it on uh, gum tree and all that kind of thing? So, uh, um, I mean, I've known people that have had costumes where it's like uh, they spend a lot of money on it. So at every single event uh, you see it and I think after a while it must get a bit tiring. So you go, oh, not him again. So there must be a point where that return on investment must get worn out. So um, I, I think sort of what happens after that? Does someone else inherit the costume or do they sort of have a funeral pyre and bury the costume uh, on an open flame or, or whatever it is? So it, it's got to be expensive. So people can't just keep doing it unless, as if they want to really max out their credit card. So it's it's got to end somewhere. Yeah, it's so, interesting. Sorry, go you and PS, go for it. I was going to say, my Royal Guard costume over the last probably five years, I pretty much semi-retired it. So it's mm -hmm. sitting in its, in its box doing nothing because, A, we don't have the same – we just do have the same wow factor with it, but it's just not – we're not doing enough Star Wars stuff. And not, nothing that the 501st and Mandalor, Mandalorian Mercs or Rebel Legion can't take over. Um, but, you know, then there's also – the person underneath the suit that makes the character step out, you know, because I, it, it bugs me to no end to watch the other people who do Royal Guards walk around and their temporary take their helmets off. It's like, dude, you actually look really weird without your helmet on. Um, so, you know, you've got to have, I think, the attitude, regardless of how much it costs, I think you need to have the attitude for the character. Um, and if this uh, Emily is doing that with the princesses, if she's acting like the princesses, then it makes the costume far more special in essence. If you're just walking around because you're a dude in a stormtrooper and you, you've you got a, a costume for Christmas, then, um, you know, that's a whole different story, I think. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's a tricky one. So, um, yeah, and there's the whole screen accurate thing that's become very prevalent in the recent decade or two decades, whatever it is, you know, the whole thing I've got to look like I'm straight out of the, off the TV screen. And, of course, the irony of that is if you've ever seen actual movie costumes in real life, they look crap, right, in mm. real life. Yeah. Um, they look good on screen because they're meant to look good on screen, but, they, you know, they have bits that have fallen off and, you know, you just know, look at the, that is absolute crap. And if you were to wear something like that, 
that is literally screen accurate, people would say, oh, that looks terrible. You've got to fix it up. And you go, but that's actually how it is. That's how it was manufactured. And uh, there's this the whole mindset of like, well, how far do you go in regards to um, trying to get this screen accurate thing? And I've known of people trying to co contact actual costumers who worked on movies to get hold of information and, you know, dyeing fabrics to a certain colour and all this sort of thing. And I get it. It's a hobby and it's a good hobby. And it's obviously very, very popular. I'm just curious to know where, how far does it go? I mean, how far, if you've got a, like your wardrobe and you've got like maybe three jackets, but you've got 58 costumes piled up there. And I agree with what you think, uh, said Jeffrey. how far do you go before you go, oh, I can't wear that anymore. That's, that's just out of date. What do you do with it? Um, I do wonder about that. And of course, I had that thing about people who buy them versus people who make them. And of course, we know, we know of people, I mean, I don't know if you know this MPS, but in, um, Jeffro would, Steve Schultz in Adelaide, made all of his own costumes, right? Physically mm. made them himself. And there's definitely an element of saying, hey, these are dudes who need to be really recognised for their talent. Robert Jan was another one who was a famous um, costumer all throughout the 80s and the 90s, and the, yeah, mainly the 80s and the 90s, and he actually missed the boat in terms of being lauded as a god in the costuming world because he stopped before all your Armageddons and supernovas and that started. But he made all of his own stuff, you know, metallurgy and, you know, banging out armour and all sorts of He was just, like, one of a kind. And um, and then, of course, you got the whole thing of, like, well, I'll just order it online and put it on and I'm good to go. So um, that seems to be the sort of the way these days where making things yourself is, is a very uncommon thing. Those who can do it, good on them, but there's a lot of people who sort of don't. So, yeah, interesting. I think there's different levels of costuming. We have to admit there are because you've got your your buy off the shelf Kmart big W um, costume shop sh uh, stuff, which fits anyone or everyone. Uh, you've got the amateur people who try and build up a costume themselves using some parts new, some parts made, and that sort of thing. You got those who make them from completely from scratch, and you got those that buy them. I think you, we have to sort of admit that there are those because, like nowadays, how many people are really making stormtrooper costumes? Yeah. You know, so mm -hmm. five of those guys, you have two hundred of them in stormtrooper costumes. How many have actually made it? Probably none. They've all bought them because they have to be special sort of um, thing and all that sort of stuff. So I think we have to acknowledge that those different levels do exist. Because um, I remember a few years back, I was in. I think it was Oz Comic Con, and I had the bat suit on. Um, and there was a family who were wearing bat suits, and they were not small people. So the father had the black Batman costume, the wife had, I think, the Catwoman costume, and the kids had Robin and, and Batgirl. They didn't look like the characters, but they were having a ball because they were in costume at an event, and they were dressed as the family, you know. So that's the sort of fun you're going to have with it, I think. And and they weren't taking it seriously, but when they saw mean costume, oh boy, the, the whole attitude changes. Like, oh my God, there's actual Batman and the kids went, Oh my God, sort of thing. So you, you've got to have those different levels, I think. Yeah. yeah I like, sorry. Sorry. Different. Yeah. I just found it very interesting about the fact you uh, mentioned about there's different levels of participation in making the costume. And I've seen a lot of these, um, uh costume events where they actually say well how did you make that so in order to be able to justify to be able to win the person actually had to describe what they did to be able to make it and i think that's the very key thing is that if you want to be uh, part of the the paparazzi the social media thing you can buy it but if you want to um be winning awards and, and getting critical credit you've actually got to justify and, and show that you've actually made it. So I thought that was a, a, a good point to make. Yeah, that was funny because um, there's a couple of comments. I'm going to get to them in a sec because there was the, uh, the Costumers Guild that existed in the, like the 2000s till about 2005 here in Victoria, and they were very adamant that they made all their own outfits and it wasn't just sci-fi, it was all sorts of fantasy and stuff, and they did some fantastic work, but they ended up closing down in Victoria, moving to South Australia just two years before Armageddon kicked in, and those... Uh, that group would have been seen as like the gods of the universe making all their own outfits and they were really, mm. really high quality too, but just missed it by that much. Um, yeah, Michelle, you're right. Yeah, little kids are definitely an exception. 
Uh, there's no doubt about that. You can put a bucket on a kid's head and everybody will just love it. Uh, Daniel, so is screen accurate and set accurate? I'd be curious to see how people deal with set accurate, considering that most people never get to visit the set uh, of anything. So if you deliberately have an outfit and you trash it a little bit and say it's set accurate, who's going to be able to justify, uh, verify whether that's actually correct or not? I find that quite interesting. Um, and, uh, and you're right. Michelle, there are plenty of people who can make most of an outfit, but maybe not all that can do some of the all the armor, for example, but can't do the fabric. We'll do the fabric and not do the armor. Well, that's fine. Yeah, there's a bit of a mishmash going on. Um, I don't think there's many people who can do everything top to bottom um, in one go. But one thing I do find interesting is that whole uh, now I'm not, I don't want to pick on organizations or groups or anything like that, but one thing that did strike me one time is the whole thing of approvals. In costuming groups, it's a bit of a thing, and I have a bit of an issue with it. But I'm not going to discuss it here in detail. But I came across a girl one time who was dressed as a, a Jedi uh, at an event a few years ago, and I thought, she looked great, right? And I actually said to her, "Oh, you look, you look fantastic!" And then she did look really good. In it. And the very first thing she said to me was, oh, "It hasn't been approved yet, right?" And I thought, yeah. well, "Hang on." So you're in your brain, you're wearing something um, inferior because it hasn't been approved by the costuming gods of the universe yet. To the naked eye, it looked fine. So does that mean if it gets approved tomorrow, you're not embarrassed to wear it, but today you are? And that's how I interpreted what she just said. It was the first thing she – I'd never even met her before, right? I just said that, and she said, no, it hasn't been approved yet. And I thought, yeah, some people have got their wires completely arse about, and I do wonder that is there an entire organisation, a plethora of people who said, well, we're the ones who got rejected. We spent thousands of dollars on these outfits. They got rejected, and it's like, well, I couldn't fix it. I didn't have the time, didn't have the money, so I just, like, Got my bat and ball and went home, and um, yeah, I do. I do sort of wonder um, if that mindset of being so screen accurate is so important that uh, people forget why they're wearing these things in the first place. And I definitely think that to be the case. The good is the color red. Yeah, well, that's right. So Daniel, uh, the Star Trek uniforms are a very good example. Now I think you're talking. Are you talking? I wonder if you're talking about the movie uniforms. If you are, there's two shades of red. So in Star Trek II, the Wrath of Khan. They're wearing a certain shade of red, which they actually found from the Paramount archives in the 1930s. And, of course, that all ran out when they got into the third film and fourth film and whatever else. But, yeah, that red was always very, very difficult. But if you did the wrong colour, like it was a darker red, I know this for a fact, this is a personal experience, it was still acceptable. People said, you know what, it's still fine. No one's going to look and go, that colour's too dark. You look shit. Go home. You're embarrassing yourself. Uh, it wasn't the case at all. And everybody had different shades of reds back then. So, um, yeah, and um, that's just sort of how it was now. That's how I think people would react if you said, well, I want to be a part of this conglomeration. I've got my costume on and someone looks at it and says, that's wrong. That's the wrong colour. You, you, you should be ashamed. Of Piss off. So, And I get the feeling that's almost what happens. So, yeah, there you go. You know, you know what happens now is because back in the 80s and 90s, there was very limited uh, resource material. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you might have a Starlog magazine or you might have a sort of making of book, but the pictures weren't always very clear. And now we've got high gloss books that, you know, like uh, the Star Wars um, costuming book, the Star Trek one, there's, you know, 4K imagery that you can take off of a, um, a, a Blu-ray. So, you know, people are getting more critical because they've got better access to the uh, the pictures and, and the imagery. So uh, I sort of feel sad for people that uh, are trying to get screen accurate because it's, 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 a, it's a high hill to be able to try and um, achieve. Yeah, well, I know certain film productions and TV shows, they make a point of adding in costume variety because they know people are going to try and replicate them. Um, they, it's almost like they add them in by default. And so you can imagine when Phantom Menace came out, right, suddenly all these women going, beauty, I can wear all these different dresses from Armandala, but they were as hard as hell to make. And some people like went to great lengths. And as you said, the, the reference and material just was very hard to get hold of. Uh, and now I know that um, they do create certain characters and movies and TV shows and put variations into them because they know the fans are going to try and, and make those outfits. And you do wonder. Uh, yeah, and I agree with you, Michelle, that is social media influence. And it's a popularity thing as well because, as I said earlier, if the expos didn't exist, they did not exist at all, nearly every costume you can think of off the top of your head would bar a few exceptions, they wouldn't exist. They wouldn't have a place to go to. They wouldn't have an, a, an event where they can get this attention. And um, so that's just how the world is currently. And I knew the world had changed when I went to an Oz Comic Con a couple of years ago, and it's like Spotlight, the fabric guys, had a stall there. Right? It's like, what the hell are these guys doing here? And then J-Car, they had a stall there. Why? Because you could sell electronics there, and, of course, you could sell fabric there. And, of course, that was the thing. Suddenly they had a market, and they realised that there was a market. So 
Uh, I mean, Jeff Rowe will remember the back of the day. If you want to contact lenses for your costume, you had to go to an optometrist, get them special yeah. order. Yeah. Now you've got stalls. You sell millions of different colours and types and varieties. Fangs for your teeth. You have to go. I actually went to an actual orthodontist to get teeth mar uh, moulded so I could get fangs made back in 1991. Now you just stick things in. It's like it's, it's just ridiculous. But that's the market now. And, of course, now you put contact lenses in, people go, big deal. So I see them all the time. It's, um, it's, it's interesting you talk about the contact lenses because I remember um, – hearing from an optometrist that's also a bit of a fan, and he was really saying that those ones that are off the shelf that you buy really can uh, damage your eyes. But, you know, people say, well, I can afford $20 to be able to do that. I'm going to get them and I'm going to look really grouse. Yeah. But, you know, to, but in the long run, they're actually uh, doing more harm than good. Yes, I had actually heard that myself as well, so there you go. So, EPS, in terms, you've been around the traps a fair bit, so... Um, how do you sort of see the, the costuming thing? Is this like what works for you, what doesn't work for you? What would you like to see that you haven't seen before? Okay. Um, what works for me? When people are wearing a costume, it doesn't have to be perfect, uh, but as long as they're having fun in it or they're, they're you know, if you're part of the, the 501st or any of those guys, You've got a job to perform, essentially. You should be in that role. If you're a family out having fun, um, then that's fine as well. Uh, the only time that I, I've ever made a negative comment to someone's costume was a friend of ours, Andy, because he had a Batman costume on, but he's like five foot nine. He's too short for the character. So I really wanted... I said to him, you're just too short for the character. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, so people who should... People should wear costumes to their size and ability as well. That would make more sense. You don't want to have some um, really tall person playing an Ewok. You know, he should be a, a <laughs> sort of thing. Uh, and, you, and subsequently, the other way around, you don't want someone who's really short trying to play a, a very tall character. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but mostly, I just want to see people have fun with it because that's what it's meant to be about. And there should be no shaming at all uh, mm. in terms of people's costumes because we're all costume for a different reason you know i think i'm up to six costumes you know i've got the bat suit the royal, royal guard i've got a klingon outfit actually two klingon outfits um space ghost and the greatest american hero hmm. you know apparently the bravest costume i've ever worn as per as his comments at con 80 um but they're all different reasons and for me, one of those costumes is causing me more grief and I'd love to fix it, but I'm having trouble trying to actually fix two parts to it. So for me, that means that the costume isn't perfect in my mind. So once those two pieces are fixed, then it'll be great. It's funny because I was just thinking of Jeff Fro when you were speaking then, and one of the things that I'm just going to mention, uh, get to Ads' comment in a second, is back in our day, uh, and the, it's a different world now, we accept that. Ingenuity was more the key than anything else. And if I was to say to you, oh, yes, I remember events where there was a, a party called Come as Your Favourite TV Commercial, right? People, there's a woman dressed up as a pink bat. She's got pink bat wings. Jeff Rowe in black plastic made this gigantic Mars bar out of black plastic, mm. right? Other people wore um, like a, a cockatoo outfit because they were David Mabel from Saba. I just get the feeling those sort of things wouldn't happen anymore because it's not screen accurate, it's not approved, it's not this, it's not that. It's now got to be this big, hardcore, serious thing, and I think that's sort of uh, lost from the uh, from the whole um, uh, society there. Um uh, snobbery's in the Star Trek, Star Wars costume is anime, not so snobby. I think the, with the anime stuff there, Adzi, it's because, um, one, they tend to be a lot younger as well, and I think they've just come into it, you know, they've sort of grown into it, whereas, you know, a lot of us can say, oh, we remember a time when this, this environment didn't exist, whereas a lot of the anime people, to them it's always been there, and I think they've just come into it, and they do actually do it, enjoy it. And, and it's a lot more fun. And there's no, I don't think there's a lot of competition. I'm just sort of generalising here, saying, well, I have to be better than the person over there. Regardless of what they're wearing, they just have a lot more fun with it. And I think that has a lot to do with their age, uh, which is a key thing. So, um, uh, yeah, did you get a manual with your costume in Pierce? What manual would that be? I don't know. So there you go. I, I, I do. And Daniel uh, and oh. Darren, yeah, yeah, I lost it twice. Yeah, sorry. So, yeah. sorry. I just got the gag. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah. 
Nah, very, very good stuff. But, uh, yes, you are, in the end, uh, yeah, it should be an enjoyable thing. And I think to a large degree that's sort of just been lost uh, over the years. And I, I think certainly in terms of enjoyment, when you go to some of these big conventions and you're in costume, how are you supposed to enjoy the rest of the convention? It's not as if you can sort of like really, you know, go away and tend panels and all that if you've got all this armour and costume and all that kind of stuff. You're really there just to be able to show off. So... It's almost like doing a job. You're not really there to sort of enjoy the rest of the convention. You're just there to be sort of uh, um, a, um, a a prop to show, really. So, yeah. And that's why I that's why I make sure if I go to a con and it's for two days, I'll only put the suit on whatever suit it is for a couple of hours. Um, you know, I'll go get my autograph, I'll do my photos, all that sort of business. And once that's done, I don't have to worry about anything else. Then I'll chuck the suit on, play a bit in that walk around and then once that's sort of done i take it off and, and change again i don't because i don't i'm not part of any of the groups necessarily i don't have to work during that uh time so i can wear it as long or 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 whatever i want very good um uh yeah ads is going to put a bucket on his head i just want to see that no matter what that would just be funny as and greg i agree with you i think the doctor who guys uh, the cult doctor community rather is definitely a lot more flexible and not so harsh of critics in terms of who wears, who wears what. I mean, how many people have you seen? Jeff, I'll know the answer to this one. Where you just get a dude who puts a hat on and this big ass scarf, and suddenly they're Tom Baker. And hey, it works. And That's people right. Love it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's got the icons, so you know what it is. So, yeah. yeah exactly right. And it's worth. Well, um, sorry, go on. I was going to say, Ad did that once for a costume party we went to, remember? Yes, he did, actually. So there you uh, go. And he looked really good in it, and, you know, every, it was recognizable. Yep, totally agree. So I think that's actually a very important thing as well. We're going to wrap up in a couple of minutes, and I just wanted to leave you with this one, this thought. There was actually a dude, and I'm pointing it to Jeffro here at the moment, right there you go, who once at a costume parade wore, do you remember this, uh, Jeffro? A mat, he wore this big thing. It was meant to be a mattress with green spots. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. That was for uh, King Kong 2. Very yes. good. And he, and he got an award because he was dressed as a mattress as the best lay in town. That's very, very true. So. <laughs> very good. That's what you're missing these days. So there you go. It's all just too serious and, yeah, whatever. Each their own. Um, all right. So uh, we're actually 10 minutes ahead of schedule, but we'll probably wrap up anyway. I think we've had a pretty good run. All right. So uh, that actually brings us to the end of the episode. How good is that? So don't forget, you can actually see the replay of this on Facebook and you will be able to see certain segments like this one uh, on uh, YouTube once we start getting things up and running uh, uh, over there so if you go over there currently you've got all the moss Eisley monthly episodes there where you can watch you can see mps and i <gasps> google on as we often do and uh but otherwise in the interim uh see you guys if you're coming to on saturday to see the ostrich guys it'd be fantastic and uh, other than that we're all good and done so there we go so in the interim what can we say except stay nerdy, stay nerdy. okay all right